Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Paris Anand. I'm the Chief Investment Officer here in Asia Pacific for Fidelity International. And I'd like to talk to you today about how I believe that the geopolitical landscape and the COVID-19 pandemic are shaping, or should I say reshaping, uh, the investment environment. So clearly the first place that I'd like to start is trying to put uh, what has been Asia's experience of the pandemic into, into a global perspective. And what we can see is that despite the fact that the pandemic had its origination in a province in mainland China, that Asia overall has experienced a much lower impact of the COVID-19 pandemic than what we've seen in other geographies around the world, such as the US and in Europe. And certainly when you uh, strip out uh, uh, India as an economy, which we know has uh, unfortunately been you know, significantly impacted uh, by COVID-19, we look across the region, we can see many major economies, whether that's uh, China, uh, Korea, uh, Taiwan, uh, uh, here in Singapore, where really the, the pandemic has been very successfully managed and hence the number of infections and mortalities are very low uh, by global standards. Now I want to understand a little bit about why this is the case. Now the first thing to speak to is really about the fact that we've had this experience with previous pandemics in the region, most notably uh, SARS in 2003. And this is important because the experience of prior pandemics helps both individual behavior, such as the uh, propensity and willingness to wear masks, as well as it impacts public policy and infrastructure. So very simple things, for example, such as temperature screening at airports has been something that has been very much uh, present in the region even prior to uh, the, the outbreak of, of COVID-19. Also, we've seen one of the really successful tools in managing the pandemic has been uh, tracking and tracing devices. And this has been facilitated in the region First of all, because you have a very highly digitized economy. And the second is the different societal attitudes uh, towards data privacy. So we know that the pandemic uh, spreads in uh, outbreaks uh, rather than in waves. And hence, uh, you need the ability to manage local clusters. And here, tracking and tracing devices play a very significant role in uh, managing that successfully. So again, the digitization of the economy, uh, a very key part of why uh, Asia has managed the pandemic uh, successfully. There's also another important point, which is around respect for authority. So whether it's government policy or whether it's a specific uh, guidance on uh, um, uh, self-management or the rules around uh, how uh, an, uh, an economy or a society should function in the context of the pandemic, what you see is a very high level of compliance. Uh, not only that, but you will generally also see that high level of compliance because whatever measures are put in place are, are enforced. Now, this is very different than what we see elsewhere in the world, but it, it means that you then have that unambiguous societal alignment around doing the right thing in terms of uh, uh, managing uh, the pandemic. And, th and this also speaks to this, this wider phenomenon around uh, broad uh, societal uh, values, which is really about thinking about collective uh, rather, than, rather than the individual. So the willingness to uh, make, make personal sacrifices for the benefit of the greater good is a deep part of the culture that we have in the region and we believe must be playing a part in how people are thinking about, uh, about their own responsibility towards uh, broader society. Now I'm mentioning all of this because it's really obvious that successful uh, management of the pandemic firstly shortens uh, uh, the journey to economic recovery and uh, accelerates uh, the point at which we, uh, economies start to recover to the level of economic activity that they were seeing uh, prior to the pandemic. 
And all of our analysis suggests that Asia as a region is going to have those economies uh, globally that have the best chance of exhibiting or have already exhibited what we would describe as a V-shaped recovery, where the impact of the pandemic was uh, short. Yes, it was um, significant in certain uh, locations, but uh, the, the recovery and the level of activity, both in terms of uh, um, uh, demand, uh, but also in terms of production, uh, has now recovered more or less to the level that we saw uh, prior to the pandemic. Again, a very key area for uh, investors globally to focus on as they think about um, uh, asset allocation uh, over 2021. But I'd like to move on now to some longer duration uh, themes that I feel have been accelerated as a result of the pandemic. The first really is around this idea of a much more integrated and interdependent and interconnected region in Asia. Now, this was something that was very much happening uh, um, uh, in the sort of the, the, the years uh, leading up to the, the pandemic. We've seen uh, key uh, initiatives such as the Belt and Road Initiative or uh, the, the economic and political partnership across ASEAN, uh, really kind of rebuilding what Parag Khanna, one of our other presenters, has called the reemergence of an Asian system. So when we think about the economic outlook uh, for many of the economies across Asia, they're now much more uh, dependent on how the region as a whole uh, uh, grows and performs rather than having a very, very high dependency on the broader global economy. Again, this, this, this is a phenomenon that we think really changes uh, the nature of uh, the economic outlook uh, for Asia. And the important point to make in the context of the pandemic is that this phenomena of greater integration is only going to accelerate as we see how travel uh, opens up and restarts uh, in the wake of the pandemic. So what we are likely to see is that the, is that the travel links will open up uh, in the region uh, much more on a local basis and much more with other economies that have done similarly successful uh, jobs of, of managing the pandemic. In other words, these uh, specific travel bubbles uh, will, will open up. And what that means is that this, this high reliance, this high interdependence within the region will only accelerate and intensify over the coming years. So the journey of Asia becoming once again a much more integrated system is only going to be accelerated uh, over the coming years. The second phenomenon that I want to talk about really is, a, is the changing nature of the modern economy. Now these are all areas, the, the, the move to digitization, uh, the, the use of big data and, and artificial intelligence, and the investment in physical infrastructure. These are all areas where Asia is now starting to uh, lead the world. So especially when we think about the, the, the piece around physical infrastructure, here we're talking about uh, things like building smart cities. Uh, we're talking about transport links. Uh, we're talking about logistics. Again, a very key facilitator of the modern digital economy. These things taken together are likely to help Asia witness a productivity boom that I still think is being underestimated by most uh, economists or uh, investment thinkers globally. Now the third is in, in some ways quite a surprising phenomenon, which is the extent to which Asia is putting sustainability at the heart of its economic strategy. So we have seen, obviously in the wake of the pandemic, a greater focus on societal well-being as different uh, governments have tried to sort of manage uh, the impact of the pandemic on, on societies and on individuals. But what we're also seeing is a fresh, renewed commitment towards environmental responsibility. We've seen bold statements by economies like China, um, again, one of the fastest growing uh, economies uh, in the world, committing to having a net zero uh, economy in terms of carbon emissions by 2060, and a similar commitment by key economies such as uh, Japan and South Korea. 
So even though we are predicting that uh, Asia will be the fastest growing region of the world, it will do so uh, in a way which starts to make sustainability central to that economic strategy. Now I'd like to turn now to how this all has played out in markets and will play out in, in markets. And the first thing I want to do is to take a step back and look at how, how investors have experienced returns across the region relative to other markets globally. And what you can see is that on the whole, Asia has proven to be more resilient during this crisis than in any of the previous crises that we've seen over, over recent decades. In fact, uh, the uh, markets of, of North Asia, so China, Taiwan, Korea, have actually outperformed uh, um, um, key markets like the US and Europe. But the most important thing here is that when we compare what we have seen over 2020 to previous crises, what we have generally seen historically is that Asia has been a geared play on the downside. The high dependence on the rest of the global economy means that people have generally felt that you know, whatever uh, challenge happens elsewhere in the world, it is going to have a much more material and significant negative impact on Asia as a region. And some of the things that I've been talking about over the presentation, the greater interdependence, the lower reliance on uh, demand, the demand picture in Europe and the US is starting to be evidenced in the returns that we've seen uh, in, in equity markets over the course of this year. But now I want to turn from the equity markets to the currency markets. Because one of the key um, uh, uh, predictions that we are making around currency markets, not in the short term, but over the medium term, is that we expect to see a continued devaluation of the US dollar. Now, in part, this is because of the economic strategy that is being pursued in the US, where we're seeing significant levels of monetary and fiscal spending, but also, and very significantly, our assessment of where the US dollar sits from a valuation perspective relative to other currencies globally. So you can see that despite the fact that we have seen, according to some people, quite a surprising level of weakness in the US dollar over the course of 2020, that the US dollar remains one of the most expensive currencies uh, in the world on a relative basis um, uh, even today. And one of the ways to maybe better explain this is to try to put the, um, the appreciations and depreciation cycles of the US dollar into a longer term perspective. So you can see that when we went into uh, um, uh, the period of uh, late 2000 and early 2000s, in the early 2000s, where we had the, the phenomenon of the, uh, the bursting of the tech bubble and uh, the economic challenges that followed that, in the period leading up to that, uh, the US dollar performed extremely strongly on a relative basis and entered that period of um, uh, a crisis at a point where it was at a, a decade high level. It then uh, depreciated over the ensuing uh, 10 years. So by the time we got to uh, the financial crisis in 2008, 2009, the US dollar was at, a, was at a, an all time uh, decade low um, during that period and then proceeded to uh, recover and outperform uh, as we went through uh, the, last, the last sort of 10 years. So where we sit today, we are again at a point where the US dollar is not at a short term but at a long term uh, peak of a cycle and hence uh, we feel confident in talking about a, a longer cycle of depreciation of the US dollar. And that is really key for uh, global investors. Um, firstly, because I think when it comes to uh, key regions such as Asia or looking at emerging markets uh, as an asset class, uh, we see that a falling US dollar is generally a tailwind uh, for those economies. But it also means that global uh, investors will look to um, grow their exposure to non-dollar denominated assets. And again, this plays into uh, the case for, uh, um, for investors to really focus on, on Asia as a region. 
But I'd also like now just to talk about fixed income markets. And, you know, we're talking about particularly a, um, a phenomenon that we're describing as the hidden dragon of 2020, which is uh, the scope for an accelerated uh, inflows into the onshore bond market in China. Now, we continue to see value across the Asian fixed income markets in general, be that investment grade or high yield or rates. But I think that there's a particular story around the China onshore bond market that is worth uh, discussing in, in a bit of detail. So the first point uh, to make is that it is already a sizable market. The China onshore bond market is $15 trillion in size, and we expect that uh, to grow significantly over the coming decade. In fact, almost a double in size over the coming decade. Now, but what I feel is a increasing probability is that even the upper range of our current estimates around uh, the, the, the scale of the bond market could actually uh, be exceeded uh, given this level, increased level of foreign um, uh, demand. Now, why is that? Well, you know, there are, there are certain, you know, drivers behind this demand. The first is a growing inclusion of the onshore bond market in global indices. So as, you know, as we've seen over recent years, uh, as uh, different uh, global uh, bond indices include the China onshore bond market at higher weights, that in itself uh, leads to flows uh, into, those, into that market. But the second phenomenon really just talks about the increasing need uh, uh, for global investors to seek diversification in portfolios. And the reason this is so important is because when we look at other bond markets globally, the consequence of the level of central bank stimulus and the, 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 the scale of monetary intervention means that there is very little value and a much lower correlation, uh, sort of much higher correlation of other global bond markets to other markets like equities. So the diversification that, that the fixed income markets have typically offered is now uh, much more challenging. However, that is very different when we, when we look at a market like uh, China, because you know, if we look at how uh, the, the economic strategy that has been pursued by China, it has been very different to what we have seen elsewhere in the world. China has chosen not uh, to monetize the crisis not to entertain uh, the same level of uh, monetary stimulus and as a result has a, a, a fixed income market that not only is offering um, attractive returns but is also acting as a source of diversification uh, for global investors. So this is something that I feel will add an additional uh, level of demand, create that additional acceleration of foreign capital uh, trying to access the returns available and the diversification available in the uh, onshore bond market in China. And if we try to put this into some kind of scale, what we can see at the moment is that global investors uh, of this you know, significant $15 trillion uh, market, uh, foreign investors own around 3% of the market in totality. Now, when we think about you know, how, the, how does that compare to um, uh, all other uh, bond markets when we look at the scale of foreign ownership, it's typical that for most uh, um, uh, bond markets, foreign ownership is anywhere in the region of 10 to 15 to 20 percent. So the starting point when we look at China, it suggests that the foreign investors have a lot more that they can grow in terms of their allocation uh, to the onshore bond market. So the level of demand that we see uh, could exceed all expectations and to me is a very clear area of focus for all investors and asset allocators. Now, if I, one way of trying to summarize what I'm saying is that I believe that as we look into 2021 and beyond, that global investors should really start with Asia and then broaden out from there really try to focus to ensure that they've got the right level of exposure to the region and then start to think about what is happening elsewhere in the world. But of course we know that today that is not the case. 
We know that most uh, investors, uh, most strategists, most asset allocators uh, do the very opposite. They start in the US and then think about uh, the rest of the world in that context. And I guess the key message of this presentation is that feels to me uh, like uh, the wrong strategy or the wrong starting point. But just to illustrate the point around, you know, why I believe that this remains a, uh, um, a, a sort of an underdeveloped uh, perspective, you know, if you look at the sort of the gentleman on the slide, I can almost uh, promise that everybody, you know, knows uh, who this person is. Uh, they know the, the, the role that he holds. Um, uh, they know what, what year he took office. And they could even tell you over the last 12 or 24 months some of the key uh, decisions uh, that, that is made. I think, on the other hand, very few people would be able to tell you who this gentleman is, uh, who, of course, is, is Governor Yi of the People's Bank of China. And what that tells you is that people are still much more focused on uh, the US central bank strategy than they are on the central bank strategy of China or the economic strategy within China or other uh, economies uh, within the region. Another way of describing this is that, you know, I still feel that many investors globally have, have selective attention. And this is a very famous uh, um, uh, psychological experiment uh, where um, people are asked to sort of count the number of passes between two sort of basketball teams. But the point, the point of the uh, experiment is that halfway through this video, um, uh, uh, an, an individual dressed in a, in a gorilla uh, outfit comes on, uh, beats their chest and walks off. Now, the, the point is that most people miss the gorilla. They're too busy sort of watching the basketball passes, doing what they were doing, and they miss uh, the gorilla in, in, in the room. And so really, in conclusion, what I want to say is that we are, you know, as a result of the pandemic, as a result of the changing geopolitical environment, as a result of a... Um, uh, an unprecedented period uh, in, in markets and the global economy, are... In, at the outset of a significant uh, turning point in terms of uh, the priorities for investors and asset allocators globally. In short, we would like to share with you our conclusion that Asia's time has come. Thank you very much.